Uh, thank you. It's a rather empty hall today. So anyway, let's try to make do with what we have. Uh, the topic for today, as you heard, is pediatric hypertension. And uh, uh, during the course of this uh, uh, talk, I'll be introducing you to pediatric hypertension and uh, uh, we'll be, uh, uh, I'll be defining pediatric hypertension and uh, we'll be discussing how pediatric hypertension uh, differs from adult, or the definition rather differs from adult hypertension. Blood pressure measurement in children is extremely important and we'll be touching on that. And followed by that, we'll be uh, just touching on the pathophysiology and etiology. And finally, ending with evaluation and management. So uh, to introduce you to pediatric hypertension, uh, it, uh, pediatric hypertension has becoming, become an increasing problem uh, due to the emergence of uh, the epidemic of uh, obesity globally. This is more so in the West, but it is uh, uh, gaining uh, ground in, in uh, this part of the world as well. Now, the identification of the metabolic syndrome, which is directly related to uh, the epidemic of obesity, has also led to a growing awareness uh, regarding pediatric hypertension. Now, obesity is related to uh, essential hypertension or primary hypertension, uh, but in the majority of uh, patients with pediatric hypertension, what you see is renal or renovascular hypertension. And this remains the predominant cause in childhood. Now, uh, in adults, as you know, essential hypertension is by far the most important entity. And this is why pediatric hypertension is usually managed by a nephrologist, whereas adult hypertension uh, is managed by uh, uh, physicians and cardiologists. Now, another point to remember is that the development of centile charts to detect hypertension is part and parcel and is fundamental for the identification, for the definition, and for the management of children with hypertension. Now, these uh, centile charts are graded regularly. Uh, this has been taken from the 2017 guideline of the American Academy of uh, uh, Pediatrics. And as you see, uh, you get the center, you get the, uh, the patient's hypertension centile as the 50th, 90th, 95th, and 99th centile. And I don't know whether it's clear, it's probably blurred, but this is what you see, what you are, what you're supposed to see rather. And uh, you see, you get the age of the patient, and for the age and the height of the patient, you can uh, identify the patient's relevant hypertension history, hypertension center. And you get separate charts for males and females. So basically, you have a hypertension centile for the age, height, as well as the sex of the patient or the gender of the patient. Uh, these latest uh, charts have been updated, uh, have been upgraded rather from the previous charts, and these charts have been formulated. Uh, excluding patients with obesity. So all patients with obesity, their values have not been included when formulating these charts. The charts that appeared in the previous guideline, uh, the, uh, the previous guideline on the fourth, which is commonly known as, as the fourth report, in those uh, guidelines, patients with obesity were also included, but they found that that uh, uh, they found that that was not uh, suitable, and they they've excluded obese patients from uh, the latest uh, hypertensive cent hypertension centers. Now, to deal with the definition of pediatric hypertension, pediatric hypertension can be defined as the average systolic blood pressure that is uh, equal to or uh, average systolic and or diastolic blood pressure that is uh, greater than the 95th centile for gender, age, and height of the patient on three or more occasions. So you need to monitor, you need to measure the blood pressure, and it has, it has to be high on three occasions uh, for, you to for you to diagnose the patient as hypertensive. Uh, so, as I mentioned, there's a fundamental difference in the diagnosis of hypertension in children here uh, because the B BP values that are used to define hypertension in, it, in adults, uh, the cutoff levels are based on the association of those levels with increased morbidity and mortality. So, that's in adults, but in children, the definition of hypertension is based on normative data uh, uh, from B BP patterns in healthy children. So, basically, according to this definition, 5% of the population would be hypertensive. How do you classify pediatric hypertension? Now, there are four classes that uh, have been identified. Firstly, you've got patients who are obviously normal. Then you get patients with 
uh, the, um, who fall under the category of elevated blood pressure. This was previously called uh, uh, prehypertension. And then you get stage one and stage two hypertension. So in children under 13 years of age, normal blood pressure is when the blood pressure falls below the 90th centile. Uh, when the blood pressure falls below, uh, falls between the 90th centile and the 95th centile, it is termed elevated blood pressure. And stage one hypertension is when the blood pressure is between the 95th centile and the 99th centile plus 12, mini, 12 millimeters mercury. Uh, that's stage one hypertension. And stage two hypertension is where there's severe hypertension and uh, the blood pressure is above the 99th centile plus 12 millimeters mercury. That's for children under 13 years of age. For, for those above 13 years of age, it's similar to the adult values, uh, where below 12080 is normal. Between 12080 and 12980 is uh, termed elevated blood pressure. 13080 to 13989 is stage one hypertension, and above 14090 is termed stage two hypertension. Now, if a child under uh, 13 years of age fulfills the criteria for the relevant stage of hypertension of a child above 13 years of age, you use that, uh, you use that entity uh, rather than, uh, even though it falls below the relevant center. Say, for instance, if the child's blood pressure uh, is below, is above 120 80, uh, the child uh, should be categorized as elevated blood pressure, even though the centile lies below the 95th centile. So these these uh, these staging has been again obtained from the uh, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics guideline of 2017. Now uh, we also need to touch on white coat hypertension, uh, which is where the blood pressure is above the 95th centile in a clinical setting or in hospital, but below the 90th centile uh, when blood pressure is checked at home. Mass hypertension is essentially the opposite, where the blood pressure is above the 95th centile outside a clinical setting, as in home, but it's below the 90th. But it is below the 90th centile when checked in hospital. So it's essentially essentially the opposite. Now, you obviously need ambulatory blood pressure monitoring to detect uh, these two entities. Uh, and white coat hypertension initially was thought to be an entirely benign phenomenon, but there have been studies that uh, have shown that uh, children with white coat hypertension tend to have an increased incidence of hypertension in adulthood. So it's not entirely benign, though previously thought so. Uh, measurement of blood pressure, again, is very important in children. We get a lot of referrals because blood pressure has measure, been measured with the wrong uh, uh, cuff size. And uh, this is you, you measure blood. If you measure blood pressure with a uh, cuff that is too small, that's one of the common uh, mistakes people make in diagnosing hypertension. So you need to choose the proper cuff size. So how do you do this? The proper cuff size uh, uh, to measure to get to uh, obtain a proper proper cuff size, you need to get the mid-arm circumference, which is the arm circumference measured at the midpoint between the acromion uh, process and the olecranon, and at that midpoint, the length of the bladder of your cuff should cover more than 80% of the mid-arm circumference. So your bladder, the length of the bladder cuff should cover more than 80% of uh, your mid-arm circumference, and the width should cover at least 40% of the mid-arm circumference. So your, the width of uh, the blood pressure, uh, the blood pressure uh, cuff should cover 40, at least 40% of uh, the mid-arm circumference. Or uh, in, in easier terms, the width of the cuff should be at least two-thirds of the length between the olecranon and the acromion process. So it's important to, uh, uh, to choose the correct cuff. And if you do not have the correct cuff, always go for the cuff that is slightly uh, uh, larger rather than going for a cuff that is smaller. Because uh, if you use a cuff that is sm smaller, you're, you will be uh, diagnosing hypertension when there is no real hypertension. So ideally blood pressure should be monitored, in a, it should be checked in a patient who's been sitting for half an hour uh, without any, uh, in a very calm environment, without any agitation uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, this is probably impossible in our setup, but we've got to make do what, what we have. Uh, just to touch on the pathophysiology, I thought there'd be medical students here, so it's not really important to the rest. So blood pressure is equal to cardiac output plus peripheral into peripheral resistance. Uh, 
and cardiac output in turn uh, is uh, is uh, based on the stroke volume and the heart rate. So anything that would increase your cardiac output or your peripheral vascular resistance would increase your blood pressure. And for that matter, anything that would increase your cardiac output, the stroke volume or the heart rate, an increase in stroke volume or heart rate would uh, increase your cardiac output and thus increase blood pressure. So what, inc what increases cardiac output? So an increased intravascular volume, uh, will, it, will it be due to increased salt intake, salt retention by the kidneys, uh, activity of the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis, sympathetic activity in insulin, all these lead to sodium and water retention, and you get an increased cardiac, uh, increased uh, uh, intravascular volume, causing an increased cardiac output. Sympathetic tone also increases the uh, increases your cardiac contractility, increasing the stroke stroke volume and thereby hypertension. What causes an increase in peripheral vascular resistance? Angiotensin II, sympathetic activity, and endothelin are commonly uh, noted entities and a reduction in nitric oxide, which causes vasodilatation or relaxation of the blood vessels, is also a factor that is, that is important here. Uh, structural changes are also important to increase peripheral vascular resistance, but these are more important in adults because uh, pediatric patients, uh, uh, the, the patients we see usually don't have much structural vascular changes unless they have had hypertension for a prolonged period of time. Uh, just to touch on the effects of hypertension, so the brain, you can have hypertensive encephalopathy or stroke. Uh, in the retina, you can have hypertensive retinopathy, nephropathy, myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy, and so on. So hypertension is dangerous. And uh, moving on to etiology, traditionally, hypertension has been classified as primary or essential hypertension uh, and secondary hypertension. Now. Essential hypertension has, as I mentioned, increased in prevalence uh, with relation to the, uh, the obesity epidemic in childhood and adolescence, uh, and this is the most common entity in adults. But secondary hypertension, as I mentioned, is more common in children. And uh, when talking about secondary hypertension in children, the most common form of secondary hypertension is renovascular hypertension. Uh, so how do you, when would you suspect secondary hypertension? So the younger the child with hypertension, you need to suspect a secondary cause. And also if the hypertension is very severe, the more severe the hypertension, you need to suspect a secondary cause. Uh, essential hypertension does not tend to be uh, too severe even in the obese child with hypertension. Uh, I'll put this slide just to show you how the etiology of hypertension changes with the age of the child. Now, this is important because there are various, there are different entities that you need to suspect if you detect hypertension at different ages. Now, in the neonatal period and in the first year of life, renal artery stenosis and coarctation of the aorta are important, and you also get autosomal recessive polycystic kidneys and renal parenchymal disease. Here it is due to CACUT or uh, congenital abnormalities of the uh, kidney and urinary tract, whether it be a PU valve or bicyclic reflux or a PUJ obstruction. Anything can cause uh, hypertension. So uh, these are the most important entities in the first year of life. Uh, from the ages of one to five, uh, in slightly older children, renal parenchymal disease, again due to CACUT, and also due to the glomerulonephritis predominates and uh, renovascular endocrine and endocrine causes also come into the picture. And you would see that essential hypertension is definitely not an important entity at this age. It's rare. Uh, older children, again, still renal, renal parenchymal diseases due to the above entities uh, predominates, but you see essential hypertension is now growing in importance. And when it comes to the 10 to 20 age group, in the West, especially, essential hypertension is the predominant cause uh, with renal parenchymal uh, disease and re or renovascular hypertension uh, coming next. But I think in, 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 our, in our part of the world, still renovascular hypertension would probably be the most important entity. So how do you evaluate a patient with hypertension? We just rush through this because it's, 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 it's common sense. Uh, the presentation can be with features of hypertension, um, like with headache, dizziness, seizures, epistaxis, vertigo. 
But importantly, in small children, in infants, weight loss and irritability uh, can be uh, symptoms of hypertension. So that you need to uh, keep an, uh, keep an open, open mind out for. Uh, the child might present with features of urinary tract infection or have features of CACUT with abdominal pain, dysuria, and frequency. There may be features of an abdominal nephritis or a connective tissue disease. There may be features of uh, palpitation and uh, uh, hot flushes and sweating and weight loss due to hyperthyroidism. So the, the features on presentation can be quite uh, varied. And uh, the use of the well, the drug history denoting illicit drug use is probably important in older children, but it is quite important in Western countries. Uh, in the past medical history, I'd like to stress on this, uh, this umbilical arterial catheterization in the neonatal period. Now, this is commonly undertaken in our practice uh, in, in, neonatal, uh, uh, in, in uh, neonatal ICUs, and this is, has a strong association with renal artery stenosis. So in any hypertensive child, this part of the history needs to be obtained. Neurofibromatosis is, also, is associated with uh, uh, renal artery stenosis as well as uh, FAOs, uh, as is von hippel lindau disease. Uh, fam family history, obviously, essential hypertension is familial. Renal disease like IgA nephropathies as well as CACUT is familial and uh, Tumors like FAOs also can be familiar, so they also need to be checked. Uh, evaluation, again, let's trust you. So you need to get the anthropometry right. The height, weight, and BMI needs to be calculated, especially if the child looks obese. There may be features of chronic kidney disease. There may be features of connective tissue diseases or nephritis. There may be features of Cushing syndrome. The child may be dysmorphic, like in Williams and Bardet beetle. And uh, the child may have uh, acanthosis nigricans to uh, detect to denote uh, 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 essential hypertension and the metabolic syndrome. So examination, you need to look into these entities on your general examination. There may be certain aspects of the cardiovascular system with, which point to uh, certain etiologies or specific etiologies like radiofemoral delay in coarctation. Abdominally, you might find a mass, uh, a palatable mass in uh, cystic diseases and in uh, neuroblastoma or uh, in patients with uh, CACUT or obstructive uropathy. And there may be uh, uh, a brui in uh, renal artery stenosis. Uh, features of encephalopathy would indicate severe hypertension. So these are what you need to look for in examination. How will you evaluate the hypertensive child? Now, these are the basic investigations that need to be done in all children. So you go through the basics. You need to cover your renal function. You need to look at your urea and the electrolytes because uh, certain electrolyte changes are associated with certain monogenic forms of hypertension, like Gordon syndrome and Little syndrome. Uh, you need to uh, do the urinary analysis because this can uh, uh, give you features or show uh, evidence of a glomerular nephritis. Uh, Proteinuria is useful to detect endorgan renal involvement. All children with hypertension need to have a renal ultrasound scan. Now, this is because cystic disease and CACUT or congenital abnormalities are common, uh, are common causes of hypertension. So you need to uh, look for these uh, actively. And you also need to do, you do your Doppler studies to look for renal artery stenosis because this is also uh, a, common, a relatively common in children. So this is part of the initial workup in all children. Uh, electrocardiogram and, gram, gram and echocardiogram are needed to look for left ventricular hypertrophy uh, as an endorgan involvement, and echocardiography also serves to uh, look uh, serve to detect uh, coarctation of the aorta. So these are the investigations you do in all patients with hypertension, all pediatric patients with hypertension, uh, irrespective of what you suspect. And Further expansion of your investigations would depend on the etiology you're suspecting. So if your history examination and the basic investigations point to a certain etiology, you expand your investigations likewise. And you don't have to do this gamut of investigations in all patients because they're costly, they're they are associated with radiation, and they, uh, they, um, it, it, it's, it's not necessary to do all these in all patients. So if the patient has evidence of renal artery stenosis, uh, uh, like you see here, you hear a brui or there is uh, uh, some evidence on ultrasound scan, uh, you, you do the plasma renin activity and the aldosterone activity 
and ultimately end up with a, with a renal angiogram. If the patient has evidence of a nephritis, you do the nephritis immunology. If the patient has evidence of CACUT, you need to do the nuclear medicine imaging as well as radiology. So you expand your investigations depending on what etiology your history examination basic and basic investigations point to without doing all investigations in all patients. Right, okay, so let's move on to management, which is well, probably more interesting than the rest of it. Uh, Therapeutic lifestyle changes, or TLC, uh, is important in all aspects of all, you know, all stages of pediatric hypertension. Uh, TLC uh, can also be called the tender loving care for patients with hypertension. So what is the tender loving care for patients with hypertension? Weight reduction, a low salt diet, aerobic exercise for at least 30 minutes, three to four times a day, Reduction in sedentary lifestyle, which is one of the most important entities apart from uh, uh, reduction in junk food uh, uh, intake. Sedentary lifestyle, mean, reduction in sedentary lifestyle means reduction in tap time, reduction in TV time, and now reduction in PlayStation time. So these are some of the main things that uh, cause uh, obesity in children. Dietary alterations, obviously, you, stop junk, you need to stop junk food and reduce the uh, 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 refined sugar and fat intake, but also you need to increase, actively increase the food and fiber intake. These are all important and uh, they are useful across the board in all patients, in all stages of hypertension, and for that matter, for those in, at risk of hypertension as well. So let's move on to Right, move on to pharmacotherapy. What are the indications for pharmacotherapy in pediatric practice? Now, for stage one hypertension, you'd obviously, within the first, in the first three months, you try with uh, therapeutic lifestyle modifications or TLC. And if this hasn't worked in three months, then you need to obviously start your pharmacotherapy because you failed to achieve control. Stage two hypertension, symptomatic hypertension, secondary hypertension, and hypertension with evidence of end organ damage, like left ventricular hypertrophy, retinopathy, or proteinuria. If there is evidence of end organ damage in all these uh, four entities, or five in four entities, you need to start pharmacotherapy at the outset, outset, or at the diagnosis of hypertension. Also, if there is coexisting diabetes, pharmacotherapy needs to be initiated at the outset. And if the, if the patient has other additional cardiovascular risks like hyperlipidemia, again, you need to start uh, uh, pharmacotherapy at the outset. So stage two, symptomatic, secondary hypertension, end organ failure, end organ damage rather, uh, coexisting diabetes and hyperlipidemia, you need to start your antihypertensive or pharmacotherapy at the outset. So how do you manage? If the patient's blood pressure is normal, and the patient is at risk of hypertension. Say I'm talking about a patient with renal scarring, a patient with bisaccharitic reflux, a nephrotic for that matter. Now, these patients are at risk of hypertension, but their blood pressure may be normal. Now, these patients should have their blood pressure uh, monitored at least every six months. And if there is elevated blood pressure, the blood pressure measurement should be at least every three to six months. And you, you treat them if they are symptomatic or have comorbidities. Uh, in stage one hypertension, monthly blood pressure monitoring is essential. Treat if comorbidities are present or if the patient is symptomatic or the patient has been unresponsive to TLC. So that's where you would treat stage one hypertension. And patients with stage two hypertension obviously need initiation of pharmacotherapy uh, at the outset. Uh, therapeutic lifestyle changes, as I mentioned, I can't stress this more, need to be applied across the board in all stages of hypertension. Sorry, I think. So what are the goals of hypertension? The goals you need to achieve by controlling hypertension. Now, if the patient, that patient has no comorbidities, so there's no left ventricular hypertrophy, there's no target organ involvement, uh, no co there's no, there are no comorbidities like diabetes or uh, chronic kidney disease or uh, 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 hyperlipidemia for that matter, or the patient has no 
loop target organ involvement like proteinuria or left ventricular hypertrophy, you can keep the blood pressure below the 95th centile. So your target is to keep the blood pressure below the 95th centile. If there are comorbidities or the patient has target organ involvement, you need to have stricter control and keep the blood pressure below the 90th centile. And for patients with CKD stage or chronic kidney disease stage 2 or above, uh, that is a patient who has a GFR less than 90, uh, you need to have very strict blood pressure control and keep the blood pressure below the 50th centile because this has been shown to uh, reduce, the, uh, reduce the progression of chronic kidney disease. So this is important. Uh, an escape study which came out some uh, time ago uh, stressed this quite, quite clearly. So how do you approach pharmacotherapy? What drug to start, when to start, how to start? So you start with a suitable agent, depending on the etiology uh, of the, of the between, depending on the etiology for the hypertension. And you start at a lower dose range and you increase it to mid-range. Start at low dose, increase it to mid-range. And if at that point, at mid-range, if the blood pressure is not controlled, uh, you can uh, follow one of three strategies. Firstly, you can increase the dose to the max. You can increase the dose of the drug gradually to the maximum dose, which is called step-up care. Or you can replace the drug. If you're going to maximum dose, you can replace the drug with another class of drug. Say you replace your calcium channel blocker with uh, an ACE inhibitor. That is, that is called sequential monotherapy. So both these, the first two strategies, have the advantage of sticking to monotherapy or using only a single drug. But uh, uh, the third entity uh, is where you add on another agent without optimizing the first agent. Uh, so this should be of a different class of drug. Like say you uh, not achieve con adequate control with an ACE inhibitor, you add on a diuretic or a beta blocker. So this loses the advantage of monotherapy because uh, and it can you know be a, a problem with for compliance, but in patients with secondary hypertension, this, uh, the last strategy, is probably what achieves best control, uh, though it, uh, it uses more than one drug. So the choice of medication, uh, ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers are the most commonly used entities in pediatric practice, and they're the most popular first-line agents. Beta blockers are used... Uh, usually as add-ons to uh, an ACE or a calcium channel blocker, but uh, they're useful in patients with isolated systolic hypertension and anxiety-related hypertension. So in these patients, beta blockers can be used as monotherapy. Diuretics, again, are uh, 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 used as add-on uh, therapy, but in patients with acute glomerulonephritis, say post-streptococcal acute glomerulonephritis, uh, diuretics should be your uh, first choice of uh, antihypertensive. Uh, uh, I mentioned about the use of ACE inhibitors in infancy. Now, remember, uh, your renal maturation uh, goes on up to two years of age. And the first six of months of age, uh, in the first six months of age, there's quite a lot of renal maturation taking place. So ACE inhibitors, by dilatation of the efferent arterial and reduction in intraglomerular pressure, uh, tend to interfere with renal maturation. So your kidneys may not mature normally if you use uh, ACE inhibitors at this stage. So it's best to avoid ACE inhibitors in the first six months of life, but sometimes if the blood pressure is very difficult to control, you, need, you, you probably need to, you need to add it on because it's, you need to control your blood pressure. Uh, in acute renal failure, obviously, we avoid ACE inhibitors, proteinuric states, in proteinuric states, ACE inhibitors and ARMS are the drug of choice. Uh, in renal artery stenosis, obviously, we all know that uh, ACE inhibitors are contraindicated in bilateral disease because they can uh, uh, just knock off your renal function completely. But even in patients with unilateral renal artery stenosis, uh, the use of ACE inhibitors can reduce the renal perfusion, and this can lead to involution of the kidney. So uh, if you can control blood pressure with other, uh, uh, other, other medications, it's better to do so. And if you do use an ACE inhibitor or your blood pressure is controlled only on, any, on an ACE inhibitor, you need to monitor your renal growth very closely. And if the patient is, if the kidney is starting to regress or not growing, you need to withdraw your uh, ACE inhibitor possible, but control of the blood pressure obviously is the most important aspect. 
Uh, Two chromosome tumors are treat, treated with phenoxybenzamine. In athletes, you need to avoid beta blockers because uh, these uh, beta blockers um, uh, reduce performance. So athletes are worried about their performance. Beta blockers reduce this. And also diuretics need to be avoided here because they can cause quite significant dehydration. Uh, just to touch on hypertensive emergencies, hypertensive emergency is defined as severe hypertension with, with acute target organ dysfunction. Um, this is in the form of uh, either hypertensive encephalopathy or acute heart failure. And a hypertensive urgency is where there is severe hypertension, but it is not associated with target organ dysfunction. Now, here, the desired blood pressure should uh, the 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 target is to reduce the, to reduce the desired reduction in blood pressure by 25% in the first eight hours. So in the first eight hours, you reduce the blood pressure by 25% of your desired reduction. And the rest of the reduction, or the rest of the 75% of the reduction to the 90th centile should happen more gradually. 12 to 24 hours, some guidelines even say you can take up to 48 hours to normalize the blood pressure. But the important thing is to reduce the blood pressure slowly uh, in the first 25% to has to occur over only eight hours. Uh, and this is important because uh, sudden reduction in blood pressure uh, can cause uh, ischemia, uh, cerebral ischemia and lead to stroke. So because these, especially in the, especially the patients with chronic hypertension, their brains are accustomed to high blood pressure. So to drop it rapidly, uh, cerebral perfusion will be hindered. Uh, so use uh, uh, intravenous medication uh, uh, in our setup. We use labitalol and hydrolyzine quite a lot. Uh, sodium nitroproside, I have no uh, experience with using sodium nitro nitroproside. Uh, put GTN uh, within brackets because we do tend to use quite a bit of GTN. GTN is very useful in patients who have uh, hypertensive emergencies with heart failure. So heart failure with hypertensive emergency, GTN should be the drug, should be the drug of choice. But I put it in uh, in uh, brackets because uh, GTN has not entered any of the uh, pediatric guidelines. So I'd like to end with a few practice points. Measurement of blood pressure in infants and children can be uh, challenging and requires the proper and appropriate equipment. Uh, children with blood pressure uh, with high blood pressure readings. Uh, are likely to de demonstrate the tracking phenomenon, and this is where patients with hypertension have their hypertension persisting into adulthood. Uh, this is especially so with patients with essential hypertension. The etiology of hypertension varies according to the age, with spinal parenchymal hypertension common in younger children, uh, essential hypertension becoming more predominant in older children, and therapeutic lifestyle modifications are important in all aspects of hypertension. Uh, I think I'll end there. Thank you. These are the references. Thank you.